Let's Talk Family Trust for real estate investors, developers, business owners, and other investors. I'm George Duby, saving the world from tax, one bow tie. What's a family trust? I'm not going to provide what I would call a legal definition for this, but more how I try and explain it in my interpretation to clients. And so I'll start with, it's this form of entity that is holding assets on behalf of beneficiaries of the family trust. And a beneficiary kind of loosely defined as someone who may receive the benefits of the family trust. So in a stereotypical situation, we might have mom and dad that are through the family trust controlling assets, controlling income on behalf of those beneficiaries. Later on, mom and dad can essentially as trustees, assuming that they are trustees, control and decide how they're going to distribute income and assets on a go-forward basis with that family trust. Does a family trust make sense if I don't have kids or maybe I'm not married? So in terms of the not married part, well, maybe you're separated, divorced, and you do have kids, so we're back into the same boat. I don't have kids and, and perhaps don't have any intention of having kids. Well, now our questions get to if, roughly speaking, I'm going to lose 25% of my estate to Revenue Canada upon passing away or my spouse passing away, would I rather see that money go to Revenue Canada? I guess technically it's Department of Finance, Government, etc. But let's call it Revenue Canada. Or would I rather see that money go to my nieces and nephews? Maybe I have foster children. Maybe I'm still trying to ensure that my church and cancer society, et cetera, are taken care of. And not that there's not other ways of helping accomplish this, but if I'm playing with 25%, do I want the government to have control of that or do I want control of that? So I would suggest while it's common to think of having our own children, grandchildren as beneficiaries of the trust, it's certainly not a requirement. Why should we be setting up a family trust if we're, whether we're a real estate investor, business owner, investor, whatever that may be? There's going to be a number of reasons that we look to, and those reasons will have different levels of importance for different families. Often I like to start off with considering what ultimately is going to happen with assets when whether it's the second of mom and dad pass away where a typical will situation will be set out such that all of the assets of the initial spouse passing away will pass along to the widow. But if we kind of go forward with that, whether it's at the first passing or the second, and there's a variety of instances where it may be the first passing, Roughly speaking, very, very roughly speaking, we may be giving up 25% of our estate essentially to Revenue Canada. If we're liquidating assets within a corporate structure, as an example, it may be a lot closer to 50%. So with that family trust, well, the family trust itself does not pass away. And while a corporation doesn't pass away, Mom and dad who are owning the shares of that corporation can pass away, whereas the family trust does not. Remember, the family trust, it owns and controls, meaning that there are not individual shareholders. There are beneficiaries that may receive assets. So with that family trust, if we're able to defer the tax, even at the lower amount of roughly 25% of an estate, and that's, again, a very, very rough approximation. That's a huge benefit to have that 25% working for the next generation. 
there will be clients that will focus on some of the creditor protection aspects of the family trust. There may be family law aspects. And again, on legal matters, highly, highly recommend speaking with your legal advisor on those matters. I love the flexibility of a family trust. That flexibility allows the beneficiaries to receive income or assets, typically dividends from a corporation or the corporation shares themselves. How does a family trust allow you to divide assets? Where mom and dad are looking at more of the estate succession planning arrangements, they may be trying to figure out how they're going to divide their estate. And so, for example, if there are two children, are things going to be divided 50-50? Maybe, maybe not. The trust allows us to decide later on who should get what. And fair may not be a 50-50 split, particularly where there may be one of the children are working heavily in the business and another child is not. Would 50-50 be the desire of mom and dad where, again, as a further example, one of the two children has two children of their own and the other has seven or eight children? What happens if one of those grandchildren has some form of mental, physical impairment that some additional funds would really help out with and get them further along? Again, those types of decisions may be something mom and dad do not have the capability of making today. And in most cases, we don't. I mean, clearly, we're going to know more in the future in terms of what we should or shouldn't do. The family trust allows us to hold things into place and give us that flexibility. We also have the flexibility in deciding who gets what income where well, we can change things as time progresses based on income levels, participation, other factors going on. We can do a variety of estate succession planning where we're saying, let's wait till we have more information, but we want to lock in the tax benefits today. So when do you typically want to set up a family trust? It's not so much the age of your children, for example. Commonly, I'll get asked, well, should the children be born? Should they be whatever age that may be? Should I be a certain age or closer to retirement, for example? My personal opinion is that, yes, I want the family trust set up in, in many cases, all of those scenarios. In terms of the size of the business or the assets, for example. Here it gets back to if, as a very, very rough number, we're going to lose 25% of our estate to Revenue Canada when the second of spouses passes away, or the first in other situations, well, at what point does 25% mean a lot to you? From a pure numbers perspective, 25% of 100 grand may do the trick. We don't typically see that for just 100 grand, of course. But it doesn't take a very big dollar figure for that 25% to mean something, particularly when we consider what that future growth is going to look like for the business empire, the real estate empire, the investments that we're putting together, particularly if we're going to benefit from some of the other reasons of setting up family trust. So in terms of when to set up that family trust, more frequently it's sooner than many people think, but something again to discuss with your advisor for your particular situation. Does a family trust own my real estate assets? A common question. Generally speaking, the answer is indirectly yes, directly no. Indirectly meaning, in most scenarios, we're going to have the real estate owned by one or more corporations, and those corporations in turn are partially or wholly owned by the family trust itself. 
Same really applies whether we've got a liquid portfolio of investments, an operating business, a hula hoop factory, whatever it may be, we'll normally have those assets in a corporation in turn owned by the family trust itself. That said, there's a special little case, and not that this is a formal name, I like to call it a TOSI family trust, where I may have liquid investments of a particular nature directly owned by the family trust. And my objective here is really to bypass certain tax rules that restrict how I may be splitting income with minor children, or for that matter, adults that are not as involved in the business or have other requirements or tests that haven't been met from Revenue Canada's eyes. Will I be able to finance properties, real estate, if I have a family trust? Unquestionably, popping into most financial institutions, the majority of the lenders are not, not, not going to be comfortable with family trusts. That said, each of those institutions will certainly have people that are more than capable of dealing with family trusts. My own perspective, the family trust actually makes it easier in a variety of cases to get financing. There needs to be a certain threshold, no question, of assets, lending, etc., that exists. But yes, I do think the family trust can both act as an impediment to financing, primarily when we're talking to the wrong people, and it can be an advantage or neutral when we are talking to the right people and admittedly have the right situation. Putting in place a family trust when we're not in a very good financial situation is not magically going to cure everything. What are the three disadvantages, or at least in my mind, of setting up a family trust? So I've gone through and I've described a lot of the rainbows and lollipops, and there are some fantastic things with family trust. That being said, there's also some disadvantages. The first, it costs a fair bit more to set up a family trust in contrast to just setting up a corporation. But it's a one-time cost and it quickly pays for itself in the vast majority of cases, or if you weren't going to have it pay for itself, you're probably focused on legal or other aspects of why you're creating that trust. Secondly is more, that trust is a bit of a pain in the rear end to set up. It takes time. I, I generally advise clients, it's probably a three month process to set up that family trust, not that, that it's intensive work, but often I call it pop, bottle of wine time, for example, where I want mom and dad to be giving some thought to who the beneficiaries are going to be, who are the trustees going to be. These types of things, as well as some others, just require some reflection. Some moms and dads will get together and they practically know instantly what the answers are. Others, it just takes some time. As well, there's a handful of things that, if done incorrectly with that family trust, that trust is forever tainted. It's useless. So, in working with my team and I, we're going to go through my checklist. We're going to go slowly, methodically through that. Because I do not want to have to explain to somebody after the fact, I'm really sorry, I messed it all up, but I did save two weeks' time. That won't fly. Third disadvantage is there's something called, or paraphrased, a 21 year rule. After 21 years, all of the assets within a family trust are deemed to have been sold for fair market value. Essentially, vast majority of cases, that would be a complete tax disaster. So instead, your advisors two, three years, for example, before that anniversary date, should be working on a plan of how we're gonna take the assets out of the family trust 
on a tax deferred basis, so we don't have to trigger taxes. And now, what are next steps? And that may be creating a new family trust. Certain conditions have to be met, but regardless of what we're doing, something has to happen every 21 years. Now, normally I would suggest if you've got a bit of a corporate structure, you are gonna change that structure every 10-ish, 15 years anyway, because there are going to be changes to your family situation, business situation, investments, financing rules, tax rules, legal rules, etc. The family trust locks in the fact that every 21 years we must deal with that. So each of these disadvantages, while not perfect, I think you can quickly see are really relatively easy to overcome. I would suggest it's not so much if I should set up a family trust, it's when. Begin those discussions. Have more questions? Please subscribe, follow, or reach out. I want all of us to have the information we need to do wonderful things.